Last time we talked about generally the idea that in the 19th century astronomers created an idea about Mars in which Mars was very Earth-like. And those ideas were based very strongly on a number of very good observations about Mars in which we found out that Mars rotates in 24 hours and Mars has seasons and Mars has polar caps and Mars has spots, dark and light spots that sort of look like they could be oceans or could be continents. And then astronomers spent a century trying to prove that they were right by measuring how much water was in the atmosphere of Mars. And for much of that century, they found lots of water in the atmosphere of Mars, except they were very wrong about that. And it was only in the 1950s and 1960s that astronomers actually pinned down exactly how much water was in the atmosphere of Mars. And the answer is almost none, which means that many of these ideas from the late 19th century about Mars probably were wrong. That's where we ended up. I think I may have finished with something that looked like this. The question is, this is a map of Mars overlaid with a cartoon of oceans on Mars. Could Mars have looked like this once upon a time? We know now that there isn't much water in the atmosphere of Mars. That doesn't mean Mars is dry. The water could be inside Mars. The water could be, you know, ver the ice caps could be enormous reservoirs of water. The question for us today is, what do we actually know about the water on Mars? That's the first part. Then I'm going to go back to the 19th century and look at some of the other developments and how people thought about Mars, most of which were kind of goofy. All right? So the answer for you is yes. Ancient Mars almost certainly looked like this. Ancient Mars almost certainly was Earth-like. It had a tremendous amount of water. It was warm. It was wet. How do we know that? Let's start here. This is an image of a feature on Mars that is known as an outflow channel. It's referred to as an ancient outflow channel because it formed a long time ago. In this outflow channel, which runs you know, from about 3 o'clock up toward about one, 9 o'clock up toward about 1 o'clock, somewhere on the left-hand side of the image, there must have been a tremendous reservoir of water underground which catastrophically heated up and washed out onto the surface and just eroded a tremendous amount of the surface. And you can see where it started and then it spread out here. You can see some of these flow features. One of the other things I want to point out here, and we'll see it again, you see the craters on Mars. And you see craters of different sizes, intermediate little baby craters. The number of craters that you see help you judge how old the surface is. You need to be careful in thinking about how old Mars, the planet, is versus how old the surface is. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. But if a volcano erupts and the lava covers over the surface, the surface is brand new. The surface does not have to be the same age as the planet itself. The number of craters we see help us figure out how old this part of the planet is. And we do that by counting the craters. And again, you'll get a better idea for this in some later slides. But this part of Mars has lots and lots of craters, which means it's very old, which is why uh, it's called an ancient outflow channel. And in fact, geomorphologists use crater counting as a technique to actually figure out exactly how old these features are. This is an image from the Mars Global Surveyor. The Mars Global Surveyor was a NASA spacecraft that orbited Mars for about a decade, from 97 until 2006. These are outflow channels. There's one in the middle of the screen. There's one on the right-hand side of that image. They are flowing downhill. As we see it, they are flowing down toward the bottom here. And we're going to see these same channels in another image. This is actually seen from pretty high up. This is in the region of the Hellas Basin. Here's a map of Mars. The Hellas Basin is this thing in the square. The basin is the whole round thing. The plain, the planitia, is the flat part in the bottom. Hellas Planitia is an old impact crater, a very ancient impact crater. It is the largest visible impact crater on any surface of any object in the solar system. It's big. 
for getting you oriented. We saw some of these things before. Olympus Mons over here is the largest mountain on Mars, the largest mountain in the solar system. There's a trio of large volcanoes just to the right of Olympus Mons, and then we have this big crack called Valles Marineris. The reason all of this stuff is located in this region, for reasons we don't understand, at some point in the history of Mars, a tremendous amount of heat was trying to come out of the planet, and it came out in that region, forming these volcanoes and expanding and uplifting the surface and causing the surface to crack. But what we're interested in here is the Hellas Planitia. If you look very carefully, over here at about 2.30 to 3 o'clock, you actually see those two outflow channels. And here's a close-up. The two outflow channels we were just looking at are right here, flowing downhill from the, the rim of the crater, flowing down into the crater. Large outflow channels. Here are some more outflow channels. The one at the top left is called Deo Vallis. And again, you see this outflow channel. Uh, it's flowing downwards, I believe. Okay. Mangala Vallis is the one on the right, and it's a long one. I think it flows upwards. This is north going upwards. And all of this is the channel. There are craters here, and you can actually see the flow patterns going around the craters. The crater is this barrier, and the water had to go around that big crater. Ravi Vallis is the one at the bottom, and that's the one we saw in the first image where the, the water was below, and it melted and came out and flowed to the right. For scale, by the way, this little mark here on each image, those are 30 kilometers or 20 miles. So these things are 10 to 15 miles across. This one here is 20 to 30 miles across. They're big channels. Yes? Is, this, is Mars evolving? Is it correlated to the way Earth evolved? Mars has evolved differently than the Earth. Uh, the Earth, in some sense, the physical Earth hasn't evolved a whole lot. The Earth is comparably warm and wet now as it was in the past. The Earth's atmosphere has evolved because of life on the Earth. Mars has not had, let's say, enough life to affect its atmosphere, but its atmosphere has evolved a lot. And the surface that used to be warm and wet with probably oceans on the surface, not anymore. The one way in which planets evolve is that they cool off. They have heat inside, and the heat comes out through volcanic activity. Mars is smaller than the Earth, so it has less radioactive material inside, so it has less heating sources of heat inside, so it cooled off earlier. That has some effect on Mars. All right, let me pull up another one here. This is known as the Athabasca outflow channel. It is this thing flowing through here. The reason I wanted to show you this one is because it's a young outflow channel. The other ones are ancient. This one, we think, is very young. If you see some craters here, this is the biggest one in the vicinity. There are a bunch of little ones, and a lot of the surface here is almost uncratered at the scale that we can see here. That tells us that this is young. And I'll give you some numbers in a few minutes on ages of some of these things. I want to bring you to Earth for an example of what we think is similar to what these outflow channels are like. This is the state of Washington, Montana, Canada is up at the top. During the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, in Montana, there was an enormous lake called Lake Missoula. And about 12,000 years ago, the glacial dam that held the lake in place in the mountains collapsed catastrophically. And all of this water flowed out of Lake Missoula and carved its way toward the west coast through Washington, creating the badlands and the scablands of Washington. And the features you can see in Washington, if you want to see more of this, Google Lake Missoula and you'll find lots of stuff. But in this image, you see these patterns here. Those are actually ripples, just like you see on the bottom of a stream. You look on a stream, you see the, the pattern in which the dirt's pushed around. These are really big ripples. Okay. The amount of water flowing out of Lake Missoula was comparable to several Mississippi rivers all at once. And the whole lake drained in a week. And all of that water coming out so fast carved out the state of Washington. 
carved out gullies and valleys and left these signatures behind. We find lots of evidence for the, this giant lake collapsing in Washington State and Montana. This is the sort of thing we're probably talking about that happened on Mars three billion years ago, two billion years ago, even 30 million years ago, which means there's still water there. This is a chart with lots of numbers, so if you can't see them, that's OK. Don't scare yourself. The first column are the names of some of these outflow channels. We've seen some of them. The one we just saw was Athabasca, the second to bottom line. The second column is the age that's given to these features based on counting the craters. When did this thing form on Mars? Athabasca formed between 2 and 30 million years ago. One of the things you have to get used to with astronomers, even worse than geologists, is we think 30 million years is a short period of time. And it was just yesterday. Compared to 4 billion years, 30 million years is nothing. All right? So some of these channels, the Ravi channel, 3.5 billion years old. The Aries channel, 2.5 to 3.5 billion years ago. The Circumcrisis formation channel, 2.5 to 3.5 billion years ago. The Athabasca channel formed yesterday, 2 to 30 million years ago. That means that at least on parts of Mars, there are still vast reservoirs of water below the surface. Today, today meaning 2 or 15 million years ago, these features didn't just form billions of years ago. At least some of them formed in the relatively recent past. This fourth column, well, the third column tells you in cubic kilometers how much water geologists think flowed in these systems. The fourth column is the easier one to digest. If you take all of the water from this Ma'adim outflow channel and you spread it evenly across the entire surface of Mars, it would form a global equivalent layer. layer. That's the GEL, a global equivalent layer, which was 0.2 to 3.8 meters thick. Right? Spread the water evenly over the whole surface. If you take all of the water in all of these outflow channels, and spread all of that water evenly over the surface, you get a global equivalent layer of 500 to 1,000 meters, 1,500 to 3,000 feet. That's a lot of water. 3,000 foot layer. We're not talking about, oh, there's an ocean here and a continent here. I'm spreading the water over the entire planet uniformly. Several thousand feet of water on the surface. That's the evidence from those outflow channels. All right, now let's crater count. This is the back side of the moon, the far side of the Earth's moon, and you can see how heavily cratered the back side of the moon is. The back side of the moon is very, very ancient. Very little has happened to the back side of the moon to cover up the craters, but you can see some regions up here, these mare, which are smoother. Lava flowed on those parts of the moon and covered up the ancient craters. Then craters form on the lava on the Mare. This is the near side of the moon, and I'm just showing this because I'm going to zoom in on Mare Humorum, which is this impact crater here. So it's a fairly large impact crater that's filled with lava. All of the Mare, all of the dark spots on the moon are impact craters. And they're big, really big. But all of the big impact craters formed four billion years ago, when the moon was very young, when the solar system was forming and cleaning itself up. After the big impact, impacts formed, there wasn't much left in the solar system. There were just little things, which formed the little craters. This is a close-up of Mare Humorum. Around the edge of the crater, you see lots of little craters. Inside the crater, that's smooth, really smooth. You've got a couple of these little tiny baby craters, but most of it is very, very smooth. We know when the big crater formed, and it was about three and a half billion years ago, and then lava filled in the crater, and the rate at which the solar system has been creating new craters over time can be estimated by looking at all those little guys. New craters form all the time. Some of you may have been to Meteor Crater in Arizona. That's an impact crater on the Earth. We don't see very many craters on the Earth because erosion erases them, plate tectonics erases them, vegetation grows over them, so they're hard to see on the Earth. 
but we have impact craters on the Earth, and they form at the same rate as they form on the Moon, which is slowly. But slowly but surely they accumulate, and over a long enough period of time, you get lots of craters, and by counting the craters, you can figure out how old these surfaces are. That's how we get the ages for these, in, these flow channels on Mars. On Mars, in addition to the ancient outflow channels, we have what are called ancient valley networks. And again, we get the ages of these by looking for the craters, the big and small. But the valley networks look like river valleys on the Earth. You have on the Earth, you'd have a river, a little stream that flows, and it comes together with another stream, and they flow together, and they all merge into a larger stream, which eventually becomes a river. That's what you're seeing in these ancient river networks, these ancient valley networks. With the outflow channels, you're seeing evidence that water was below the surface and erupted and melted and washed the land away. With the valley networks, you're seeing evidence that the surface of Mars itself was wet for an extended period of time, such that rain fell, streams formed, erosion formed, these gullies. And again, these are large. This is 200 kilometers across, 130 miles across, left to right. These are fairly long river features, which probably took tens to hundreds of millions of years to form. During part of Mars's history, it was wet enough for this to happen. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything liquid otherwise? Could some other liquid do this? There are some features we see on Mars that are happening today that could be caused slumping on hillsides by frozen carbon dioxide liquefying underneath the surface. But to form these long rivers, it has to be water. Couldn't be lava. Lava forms different kinds of channels. Okay? The lava forms tubes that then hollow out. They don't form these sorts of things. Yes? Yeah, let me come back to that. Let me try to come back to that. Um, there is evidence that Mars had an ancient magnetic field. I don't know of evidence that it still had it a billion years ago, but it had it three billion years ago. The stronger evidence for change of Mars and Mars's atmosphere, which would affect the climate of Mars, is that gases have escaped to space. And I think I have some stuff on that, so I'm going to come back to that. All right, so we have these ancient valley networks. This one is called Nadidi Vallis. You've got, again, a bunch of these. These are not outflow channels. They are different kinds of things. This is a, a close-up uh, of this little square in the middle here. That rectangle is what is on the, the right side. The left is an image from the Viking spacecraft. Part of the Viking was an orbiter around Mars in the 70s. The right-hand image is from the Mars Global Surveyor taken in 1998, where we get more detail about that. This region is called the Xanthi Terra region, which on a map of Mars, that's this region right here, left-hand side. Uh, I think I'm going to zoom in on that. So here we've zoomed in on that little region. And you see lots of these sorts of channels. Right? The whole surface of Mars isn't covered with these, but there are lots of them. Okay, again, evidence for a period of time when the surface of Mars, the atmosphere of Mars, was warm and wet. Another table to put you to sleep here. There are two different orbiting spacecraft around Mars right now that have radar. And the radar is used to bounce signals off the surface. The radar penetrates the surface and can look for what's beneath the surface. The one called Marsis, what I wanted to you to look at here is the fourth column, maximum penetration depth in the water ice. If, if these radar can see water on ice on the surface at the polar caps, for instance, the radar can measure how deep the water goes. This radar goes five kilometers into the surface. This radar, Shared, goes one and a half kilometers, a mile beneath the surface. We're not just measuring the top <coughs> centimeter of the surface of Mars. With these radar, we can penetrate fairly deeply below the surface 
to see what's there. And that's what was used to make this map. This is a map, not ancient, this is today. This is a map of the North Pole of Mars. And you have contours here, so this is like a geological contour map. But the contours are of the ice layers. How deep is the ice? How much ice is there? This is an attempt to measure how much water is at the North Polar Cap of Mars today. The contours are 100 meter contours, so this would be a pretty steep climb up to the peak at the North Pole. The estimate for the amount of water at the North Polar Cap is 300,000 to 400,000 cubic miles. That's fairly significant. That's about half the size of Greenland, the ice cap on Greenland, or at least what it was in Greenland last year. I don't know what it'll be next year. If you melted all of that water, it would form a global layer 30 feet, 30, yeah, 30 feet deep. Now we're no longer talking about how much water Mars once had, because those outflow networks tell you that Mars once had 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 feet of water covering the whole surface. That's why we can give you that cartoon I started with, with the northern hemisphere of Mars being very blue. That represents the water Mars absolutely once had. The new question for us now is, what does Mars have today? And the radar we're using to map the surface of Mars tells us part of that answer. The north polar cap is a reservoir storing up water. How much water? Enough to cover the entire sur surface of Mars 30 feet deep. That's a decent amount of water. This is the south polar cap. This was made with a radar from the Mars Express spacecraft, which is a European spacecraft. The southern polar cap, uh, total ice volume, again, about the same, 400,000 cubic miles. This estimate of 36 feet deep, I think, is based on the 400,000 instead of the 300,000. But basically, the two ice caps have comparable amounts of ice, comparable amounts of water ice. And together, you would have a global ocean covering the entire planet, every last square foot of the planet, to a level 60 to 70 feet deep. Mars still has a good bit of water. If we went to Mars, there's water to be found. This water is at the polar caps, and we might not want to live at the polar caps, but the water is there, a very significant amount of water. This is a different estimate of all the water on Mars, there, the estimate of how much water was once in that northern ocean that we saw in the cartoon would have been a global equivalent layer of about a thousand meters. That northern ocean is estimated to possibly have existed as recently as 200 mil million years ago, but stretched back to four and a half billion years ago. The valley networks would make a global layer up to 1,000 meters deep. The southern polar layer deposit, we said, was about 30 feet. This is in meters, so 11 to 16 meters is about 30 feet. The same for the north pole layer deposit. Uh, and again, these are recent formations. And then there's some other things that the total amount of water on Mars today is significant. The total amount of water that was once on Mars is enormous. There is a big difference between how much water we see today and how much water we know Mars once had. So now we get to the question I had earlier, did things change on Mars? Is the water still there? That's a very important question for us as future colonists. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think the average depth of the oceans is you know, two miles. Anybody know that number? Okay. It's not, you know, the deepest part of the oceans are you know, five miles deep or so. Some of it's fairly shallow. Well, 75% of the Earth is ocean. Only 25% is land. So if you just erase the continents and smooth that out, it's going to be about the same depth, right? It's still going to be a mile to a mile and a half deep. A lot deeper. And the Earth's surface, because the radius of Mars is half the radius of the Earth. That means the surface area of Earth is eight times pi r squared, four times greater than Mars. So to cover up Earth at the same depth, you need four times more water than you'd have for Mars. So the Earth has a lot more water now than Mars ever had. But Mars shouldn't have had as much water as Earth because Mars is 10% the mass of Earth. So you'd expect Mars to have 10% the water that the Earth once had. 
I'm talking about H2O. Okay? Yes. It, what you think of water is water. Potable water would be, you can drink it. It doesn't have cooties in it. Right? It doesn't have bacteria. This would be drinkable water. Right? You might want to filter it to get the calcium out of it or something, but it's, it's just water. There's, it's just water. All right. The current water reservoir on Mars from the north and south polar caps, this, this graphic says 21 meters, 62, 63 feet. That's what we just talked about, 30 feet from the north polar cap, 30 from the south polar cap. Over the last decade, a handful of scientists, a team of scientists, have attempted to measure different kinds of water. Right? It's still water. Water is made from hydrogen and oxygen. So we call it H2O, right? Two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. But there are different kinds of, oxygen, different kinds of hydrogen. Heavy hydrogen is called deuterium. And we use the letter D for deuterium. It's still hydrogen. It still has one proton in the nucleus. But nature has stuffed another neut a neutron into the nucleus, so it's heavier. So it's heavy hydrogen. It's called deuterium. This top line here, I've given you three different forms of water, H2O, HDO, and D2O. HDO would be a water molecule in which one of the hydrogen atoms is a little bit heavier. D2O would be a water molecule in which both of the hydrogens are the heavy hydrogen. If you drank it, it would taste the same. Okay? In terms of how your biology would react to the water, it would be the same. It's all it's all water. Gravity deals with those water molecules differently because HDO is heavier than H2O. D2O is heavier than H2O, so gravity pulls on some of those forms of water harder than on others. What these scientists did if, is they have looked for evidence of deuterium and regular hydrogen in the atmosphere of Mars. If you take water and you expose it to ultraviolet light, you bust the water molecule up into an oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms. The oxygen atom rusts rocks on the surface, and the hydrogen atoms stay in the atmosphere. The hydrogen atoms are very light, so they can bubble up to the top of the atmosphere and escape to space. Deuterium is twice the mass, twice as heavy as regular hydrogen it is much harder for deuterium to escape from a planet than it is for regular hydrogen to escape. So if you would put hydrogen and deuterium in the atmosphere, slowly but surely, all of it would escape to, to outer space. But the hydrogen would escape faster. So preferentially, you're going to leave the deuterium behind, the heavy hydrogen. On the Earth, one in every 6,400 hydrogen atoms is actually a deuterium atom. That means if I would hand you a bucket of water, there is some deuterium in there. How much deuterium? Well, one in every 3,200 water molecules has a deuterium atom. Your body doesn't care, biology doesn't care, but it's there. It's measurable. One in every 41 million water molecules is D2O. That's on the Earth. We think that when the Earth and Mars formed, they both formed out of the stuff that made the sun and the planets, the same reservoir of material in the solar system. If you would go to a sand pit and scoop out one hunk of sand, and someone else goes to the sand pit and scoops out a hunk of sand, you could expect that your hunks of sand would be pretty similar in composition. We think that the Earth and Mars should have been that way when the Earth and Mars formed. Earth and Mars both should have gotten their complement of water. Earth should have gotten 10 times more because the Earth's 10 times more massive than Mars. But the water we both received should have had the same composition of regular hydrogen versus deuterium. So we can test that. We, can, we know what the hydrogen to deuterium ratio is on the Earth, 1 in 3,200. We can measure the hydrogen to deuterium or the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in the atmosphere of Mars. And the answer is Mars has a deuterium to hydrogen ratio that's eight times bigger than the Earth has. It doesn't ha that means Mars has more deuterium for every hydrogen atom than the Earth does by a factor of eight. So that ratio would be instead of one in 3,200, it would be one in 400. 
That's not because Mars started with an extra abundance of deuterium. It's because the hydrogen escaped and the deuterium was left behind. That tells us that Mars has lost a lot of its water. Because the main source of hydrogen, or deuterium, right, is an H2O or an HDO molecule. And slowly but surely, over billions of years, ultraviolet light and x-rays from space have broken up the water molecules, and the hydrogen atoms have bubbled up into the atmosphere, and the hydrogen escapes to space faster than the deuterium. As a result, this deuterium to hydrogen ratio is enriched. We, have this, we found the same answer on Venus. The ratio on Venus is closer to 15 to 1. Venus has lost probably all of its water. Venus is 900 degrees on the surface. Venus is a, a wicked place. Mars has not lost all of its water, but these results very strongly imply that Mars has lost a lot of its water. And the folks who did this work think that Mars has probably lost 85% of the water it started with. And the amount of water that we see now is you know, 10 to 15% of the water Mars started with. So Mars is different now than it was. Mars has evolved into a very different world than Mars was four billion years ago. When we can talk about Mars being warm and wet in the past, indeed something happened to change Mars. And what happened triggered the loss of that water. So the original ocean in their estimate was 400 feet global equivalent layer. That actually is a little bit inconsistent with these outflow channels that say maybe 1,500, 2,000 feet of water, but whatever those numbers are, it implies that Mars, that once had enough water to have this ancient ocean, doesn't have that much water anymore. It still has lots of water, but the water's gone. There's some other evidence that Mars has lost a lot of its atmosphere. NASA has a spacecraft orbiting Mars called MAVEN. MAVEN is measuring the contents of the Martian atmosphere. And one of the things it is measuring, you can hardly see it here, but it's, it's measuring the amount of argon in the atmosphere. There's a significant amount of argon in the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen, then oxygen, then argon. Argon is a very significant component of our atmosphere. Mars should have had the same amount of argon when it started. Argon, like hydrogen, has different isotopes. You can have argon-36, argon-37, argon-38. And MAVEN is measuring these different weights, these different isotopes of argon. And just like with the hydrogen, argon-36 is lighter, so it can escape to space more easily than argon-38. By measuring the ratio of argon-36 to argon-38 on Earth and comparing that to the ratio on Earth, we get an estimate of how much of Mars's atmosphere it has probably lost. The estimate from the MAVEN team is that Mars has lost 65% of the argon it started with. And from the other team, it's lost 85% of the hydrogen that it started with, which implies a loss of 85% of the water it started with. Mars is different now than it was in the past. Why did that happen? We really don't know. There are a couple of possibilities. One is Mars is further from the sun, so it gets less heat from the sun. So that makes it a little bit different. Mars has less mass, so its gravity is weaker. That makes it harder for Mars to hold on to its atmosphere. Mars may once have had a magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field protects the Earth, protects the Earth's atmosphere. Particles from space, from the sun, mostly called solar wind particles, are coming out from the sun at speeds of several hundred miles per second. And they're like a sandblaster, blasting the top of the Earth's atmosphere. But those particles from the sun are charged particles. They're ions. And ions hit magnetic fields and get stopped. In the Earth, they hit the magnetic field, and they get channeled toward the poles. And they crash into the top of the atmosphere near the poles. And you see them as the auroras. For Mars, there's no magnetic field now. And there probably hasn't been a magnetic field for billions of years. So the solar wind particles blast the top of the atmosphere. And they erode the top of the atmosphere, which makes it easier for these argon and hydrogen atoms that bubble up to the top of the atmosphere to literally get stripped off the planet. 
And when they get stripped off, another atom bubbles up to take its place, and they get stripped off, and others bubble up, and they get stripped off. And slowly but surely, the solar wind has been eroding the top of Mars's atmosphere because it does not have a magnetic field. The lack of a magnetic field is probably extremely important as a difference in how Earth and Mars have evolved. The fact that the Earth developed life early on in abundance changed the Earth's atmosphere in an important way. We know, we saw the stromatolites two weeks ago. By the way, there was a report out the week after I talked about stromatolites saying that the evidence for the 3.7 billion year old stromatolites in Greenland is very suspect. No one questions the 3.5 billion year old stromatolites from Australia. But the teams from Australia that, dis that discovered the 3.5 billion year old ones, they think the team that discovered the 3.7 billion year old ones are wrong. <laughs> this is good. This is how science works. You have to test the results of someone else, and eventually we'll get it figured out. But on Earth, we know there was life 3.5 billion years ago. And on Earth, we know that if you travel to Colorado, you'll see Red Rock Canyon, and you have these red rock formations all over the Earth. Those formations are all two to two and a half billion years old. They formed when the early life on the Earth was producing lots of oxygen. The oxygen was rusting the rocks, creating iron oxide. That's what those red beds are. Until all the rocks on the surface of the Earth were fully rusted, the oxygen could not build up in the atmosphere. Starting about two billion years ago, oxygen built up in the atmosphere. And only after we have oxygen in the atmosphere could we have an ozone layer. And only once we had an ozone layer did we have something to protect us from ultraviolet light from the sun. That ultraviolet light, when it can penetrate the atmosphere, breaks water molecules apart. If you have an ozone layer, that process ends. The water is protected. Whether Mars ever had life is a good question, but Mars never had enough life to create an oxygenated atmosphere, to create an ozone layer, to create something to block the ultraviolet light to protect the water. So Mars never had a way to protect its water, and once the water was busted up by the ultraviolet light, it didn't have a way to stop the, oxygen, the hydrogen from getting blasted off into space. Those are probably the critical reasons why Mars evolved differently than the Earth. There's a hand over here somewhere. Um, does Mars have a comparable amount of iron? Mars should have a comparable amount of iron. Mars may not have the iron fully in the same place as the Earth. Most of the iron on the Earth is in the core because the Earth at some point became hot enough and soft enough that almost all the iron descended to the core. Mars may never have been quite warm enough for the iron to separate from the rock. We don't know that completely. We'd have to really dig a lot of holes on Mars to figure that out. Mars does not have a, a magnetic field now, but it appears to have had an ancient magnetic field, as we talked about, which means it probably does have a significant amount of iron in the core. Yes? Given the rate, the rate of the fact that the water is disappearing from the ancient to the What's the prognosis for Mars? Given the rate at which the water is disappearing, when will it all be gone? That's really the question. I don't know that answer. It has lost, if we go back. Yeah, we're, we're down to 85% is gone, 15% is left. So we've lost you know, 17 twentieths in 4 billion years. So how much longer will it take to lose the last 3 twentieths, another billion years? Maybe, give or take a few hundred million years. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, the question is about what's called the Goldilocks zone in planetary systems. The Goldilocks zone is where everything is just right. If you're too close to the star, it's too hot. If you're too far from the star, it's too cold. If you're at the right distance, it's just right. That's the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone has different definitions, but I think everyone would agree it's where liquid water can exist on the planet, or on the surface of the moon, if you will. But it doesn't have to exist all the time. If liquid water can exist on the surface for one minute of one orbit of the planet, 
So at the equator at noon on midsummer's day, for one minute, you've got a drop of liquid water, you're in the Goldilocks zone. Mars is at the far edge of the Goldilocks zone for the Earth. Now, Venus is in the Goldilocks zone for our solar system. Sorry, Mars is in the far edge for our solar system. Venus is at the close edge for our solar system. But just because you're in the Goldilocks zone doesn't mean you're going to keep your water as Venus proved. Different things can happen. All right. So this is just ignore most of the words, but our summary, water has been detected with orbiting radar that tells us there's a global equivalent layer of water now of 60 feet, maybe 100 feet. We know historical Mars at a global equivalent layer of up to a few thousand feet, up to a thousand meters. Mars has lost most of its water. We do see some features on Mars that are slumping features. This gets to a question that was asked earlier. Could these features be caused by something other than water? The left panel is an image of a region, a crater wall in what's called Terra Sienum. December 22nd, 2001 on the left, five years, four years later on the right, August 26, 2005, and you have a tremendous amount of slumping that appears to have, uh, not right there, this thing right here. That's the new feature. So over here, something slumped, something flowed. Is it just dirt that flowed? Is it water or water ice that caused this erosion feature? Is it carbon dioxide ice that somehow warmed up and caused this erosion feature? Was it caused by water flowing on the surface or something else flowing on the surface? Or is it a slumping feature the same way we get potholes in the roads? Potholes on the roads are not carved generally by the water flowing on the surface and carving it. It's water flowing under the road, and then the road collapses into the hole underneath like a sinkhole. We don't know what carved this, but there is a fair amount of evidence now for features like this that are occurring in real time on Mars. The arguments that say they're due to water are unproven. The arguments that say they're due to something other than water are unproven, so we don't know what's going on. All right, enough with water. You now know the history of water. You know what Mars has some water now. In the last 150 years, Mars never had lots of water in the atmosphere. Most of those measurements were wrong. But now I want to go back 100 years and talk about what happened at the end of the 19th century. Because at the end of the 19th century, Two people in particular had a great influence on coloring our view of Mars. We had this idea about Mars in the 19th century that says Mars is Earth-like. Two people in particular made Mars a whole lot more Earth-like than it probably is. Right. First one is Giovanni Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli was an Italian astronomer, very prominent astronomer. He became famous initially for studying this object. It's known as Comet Swift-Tuttle. This is not one of his images. This is from 1992. Comets have big heads and they have tails. And what Schiaparelli showed in 1866 is that a meteor shower that occurs in the Earth's atmosphere every August, called the Perseid meteor shower, is the result of the Earth passing through the tail, the orbital tail of Comet Swift Tuttle. All the debris that shed off the comet becomes part of its tail. The comet gets close to the sun, it warms up, the heat from the sun melts the ices on the surface of the comet, the ices sublimate, form this giant cloud. When they sublimate, they take the dirt with it, and these things jet off and then get swept out behind the comet, forming the tail. And the comet orbits the sun and creates a long, long stretch of debris behind it. This is a, the same comet. See this, this long tail, but eventually this tail will occupy the entire orbit of the comet. So this is a sketch of Comet Swift-Tuttle's orbit. It kind of goes up out of the plane of the solar system. We've got Pluto over here. But when it comes in close to the sun, that's when we see it as a comet. But this entire orbital path of the comet is filled with debris that's been shed off the comet. Because the debris keeps orbiting the sun following the comet, it just gets left behind. 
when the Earth passes through the orbit of Comet Swift-Tuttle, we get this meteor shower, and we pass through that orbit every August. Schiaparelli showed this was true. He became very famous very quickly. He received what was known as the Lalande Prize from the French Academy of Sciences in 1868, I believe. It was like getting the Nobel Prize for astronomy before there were Nobel Prizes. That cemented his reputation as a very important astronomer of the day. He used that prize and his reputation to get himself a telescope. Italy had just become a country. I think in 1861 or so, the, the pieces of Italy were unified into what is sort of the modern dysfunctional Italy. And the king of Italy wanted to do something prominent and show how forward-looking they were, so he gave Schiaparelli some money, and Schiaparelli bought himself a nice telescope, this thing called the 8.6-inch Mertz Refractor at Brera Observatory. That's where he started. So there's his telescope. He first started observing Mars in 1877. He observed Mars in 1877 just because it was there. He had no particular interest in Mars. He had other interests in astronomy. But he wanted to test out the telescope and see what he could see. And when he first started looking at Mars, he realized he could see a lot. So he decided he would make accurate maps of Mars. Other people were doing it. He said, I can do it better. And he did do it better. This is one of his first maps of Mars from 1877. This is looking at the northern polar region of, of Mars. He starts giving things names, lots of Latin names. He sees the dark areas. He sees the light areas. This is Arabia here near the equator. That makes sense. Arabia should be near the equator of Mars. That's 1877. This is a year later. This is a, an easier to understand map of Mars because it's all of Mars, uh, an 1878 map. Now he started talking about the color differences he was seeing, the dark spots, the light areas. He said the color differences were due to depth, transparency, and chemical composition in the oceans. Because that's how it is on the Earth. He says the difference in salinity between terrestrial seas causes the differences between the colors of these seas. The saltier the water, the darker it appears. It is the same on Mars. Really? He had no evidence that this was water, no evidence for salinity of the water, no evidence for any of this, but he had nice maps of dark patches and light patches. But we all knew what the answer is, because dark patch on the Earth must be oceans. He starts to draw these very detailed regions, and you see you know, pretty good detail here, what, some of which may actually exist. A lot of it might not. But this is where he started. This is 1878. This is 1879, and this isn't a great image. I don't know if we can bring down the lights a little bit. That might help in the, in the front. But now we're starting to see all sorts of features which started to have a big influence on what Schiaparelli thought about Mars. He's starting to, these long features down in the southern hemisphere are starting to become very long and skinny. Between 1879 and 1882, he'd start discovering new things. These are, again, based on his 1879 maps, diff different rotational views of the planet, but these long linear features are what start drawing his attention. This is his 1881 map. Now, we start to get some objects which have names that are still used. This feature right here is Certus Major. That's the feature that was first seen in 1859 to get the rotation period of Mars. So that's certainly a real feature. That little blob there was the feature that in 18, the 1830s, the German astronomers used to establish the latitude-longitude system that we use on Mars. This is Elysium right here. We, that's the basin we were looking at a little while ago. That we still use for a name. A lot of these names still exist. A lot of them are not used anymore. In making his maps, in his drawings, he drew little dots on his sketches. These were his Rousseau, I don't know what you call them, just little 
little dots that enabled him to very accurately map positions on Mars. He then said the complicated Rousseau of dark lines, all these dark lines, which link the patches we regard as seas, owe their color to the same causes with the seas, and can only be canals or communicating straits. So now we're deep into the canals. Remember, Secchi created the word canals for Mars in 1859. This is when Schiaparelli latches on to the idea that all of these things are canals. On the planet crossing the continents, there are a large number of dark lines to which I have given the name canals. Well, again, someone else used the name first, but I have recognized a considerable number, at least 60, lots of these things. So again, the dark areas at the top, those are the oceans. The light areas at the bottom, those are supposed to be continents. And these straight lines cross the continents. And Schiaparelli has decided they are canals. During the years 1879 to 1882, he claimed that he could see the canal system was growing. Every time he looked, there were more canals. The shortest canal was 75 miles in length. The longest canal was 3,000 miles in length. The canals typically were 75 miles wide. These are big things to carry water. He said every canal terminated to either end in a sea or another canal. They're not just random. They're connecting bodies of water to other bodies of water. This is not all he says. And this is where he really went off the deep end, in, into his oceans, I guess. This is not all. At certain seasons, these canals are doubled, or more accurately, double themselves. What he was seeing, he would look tonight, and he'd see a single canal. He'd look tomorrow night, and he would see two canals side by side, parallel canals, doubling. That's what he meant. He gave that a name. He called this gemination for Gemini the twins, right? Give it a good astronomical name. So we have a new process. The first one he observed was in 1879 for the canal he called the Nile, and he saw that the Nile doubled. In 1882, he saw four more canals that were doubling. He said, and the majority of the other canals showed up as clear and uncontestable doubles. So he saw some canals that in real time, he saw them double. Tonight they're single, tomorrow they're double. And all of the other canals, he didn't see the doubling happen, but almost all of them were clear and uncontestable doubles. And then, to make sure you knew he was right, he said, these doublings are not an optical effect. They're real. And then he says, in classic political speak, where you make sure you say the opposite of what you want everyone else to hear, he said, it is not necessary to suppose them the work of intelligent beings. Clearly, they are, right? A whole bunch of folks were a little bit skeptical about his discoveries, but he kept going. 1883, 1884, these are his maps of Mars, and you see again, lots of canals. Things aren't changing a whole lot. 1889, or 1890, this is one of his last maps of Mars, his most you know, final maps. We, again, the Hellas Basin, we still use that for Mars. Elysium, we still use that for Mars. And you can see right here a good illustration of the double channel, two parallel lines right there, parallel lines right there, parallel lines. The doubling of these canals. He had a few people who seemed to agree with him. The first confirmation he received was by an Irishman, C.E. Burton. C.E. Burton didn't do much astronomy. He's not a famous astronomer. But he is the first astronomer of any, anywhere to say, Schiaparelli's right. There are canals and the gemination, well, I'm not sure about that. I see the canals, but I haven't seen the doubling. The first confirmation he got of the doubling effect was from a French team, uh, Henri Perrotin and Louis Thollon. They claimed to have confirmed the gemination, the doubling. By the end of that night, April 5, 1886, under good conditions, we had been able to recognize successively several canals presenting in nearly all respects almost the character attributed to them by the director of the Milan Observatory. We have noted the two shaded parallel lines which make up the double canal TU, fancy name just one of the labeled canals. But they saw one case of doubling, or so they claimed. This guy, Francois Terby, made the same claim in 1888. He said, we find in 1888, we have verified at Louvain, where his telescope was, the existence of the following canals. 
and then he names 30 canals. Also, he was able to, he said, get a glimpse of the doubling of one of them. Now, Turby is no slouch. He gets a crater on Mars. Uh, this crater, which is zoomed in here, that's him. You know, he had a crater named for you. You must have done something important. He was a good astronomer. This was not one of his better pieces of work. <laughs> An American, William Henry Pickering, followed. William Pickering's brother was the director of the Harvard College Observatory. Pickering's brother was one of the most important astronomers in American history. William Henry Pickering wasn't quite up to his brother's standards. Pickering in 1890 said he had no difficulty in also observing, and then he names some, some uh, canals named for biblical rivers, I think. Several other canals in this same region have been recognized, and then he said he had the highest admiration for the eyesight of the astronomer who could discover them in the first place with an eight-inch telescope. The problem other astronomers had is a lot of other astronomers were using bigger telescopes, which should give you a better view of what you're seeing, and they couldn't see the canals. The person who began arguing and explaining why that was the case was this guy, Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell was Harvard educated as a mathematician, not as an astronomer. He liked astronomer. He had lots of money from the Lowell family uh, riches in Boston. I think his uncle was the president of Harvard. His sister was the poet Amy Lowell. Came from a, a famous family. Percival Lowell thought he had the best eyesight of any human being ever. And he could see things that other people could see. And he also claimed that if you used a little telescope, you could see the detail. If you used a big telescope, things got blurry, which is kind of. <laughs> but he went and built himself a telescope. He did some survey work and had some professional astronomers do some survey work. And in the 1890s, he decided he would build himself a telescope in Flagstaff, Arizona. He did have the insight to recognize that if you put your telescope at high elevation above more of the atmosphere, that was a better place for a telescope. So he's up at about 7,000 feet in Flagstaff. Lowell Observatory is still an important international facility. This is his first telescope. It's known as the Clark Telescope. It's inside here. That's the one he used for his first observations at Lowell Observatory in 1896. He had actually made some earlier observations using a portable telescope he'd borrowed, but he got started big time with this telescope. His observing campaign in 1894, before that Clark telescope was finished, again, was with this borrowed telescope. And it, with that little telescope, he identified 183 canals. He found 100 of them that even Schiaparelli couldn't see. He saw eight instances of the doubling phenomena. The person who said of Schiaparelli, or said of Lowell, that Lowell must be right, was a wonderful guy. Whoops. There it is this wonderful guy who went by the name of Leo Brenner. He was, I call him a quack. His real name was Spiridon Gopsevic. He was Serbian. Serbian has nothing to do with whether he was a quack or not. He just was. He had no training, but like Lowell, he had money, built himself a telescope, and made observations. He found 70 of the canals that Schiaparelli had seen, 12 that Lowell had seen. He found some canals on his own that no one else had been seen, and then to really prove how good an astronomer was, he measured the rotation period of Venus. And for that, he got 23 hours, 57 minutes, 36.27728 seconds. The rotation period of Venus is about 243 days. Okay? I mean, he was just making stuff up. But he got this. He got the stuff published in journals of the British Astronomical Society. How he managed to pull that off, I don't know, but I guess, who knows. Anyway, Percival Lowell in 1894 started barnstorming the country. In 1894, he wrote a six-article series in Popular Astronomy talking about the canals on Mars and the Martians, the Martian engineers who built them. He then wrote a four-article series in 1895 in the Atlantic Monthly. He did a series of public lectures all over the country, gathering huge crowds. And in 1895, he wrote his first book on Mars called Mars. Ten years later, 1906, he wrote his next book on Mars called Mars and its Canals. 
in that book, he said, because he had so much knowledge of this, that life evolves naturally and inevitably from chemical processes. OK, it might. But he certainly didn't know that in 1906. He has said the existence of life on Mars is inevitable. Mars must have life, impossible otherwise. If plant life exists, then higher forms of life are likely. And he thought he had seen evidence for waves of vegetation around the canals. Therefore, higher life forms must exist. Since it has all the ingredients for life, the evolution of living things must have occurred. This is sort of the Lowell thesis on life. He observed in his careful observations that he could see, literally as he watched during one evening, a dark wave moving across the surface of Mars. That must have been both water flowing through these giant canals, and instantaneously, the water caused the vegetation around the canals to bloom. So he was seeing a blooming moving across the surface of the canals. That wave of darkening, he said, swept to the poles at a speed of 51 miles per day. And that would be the speed at which the water was being pumped through the canals. He had a more interesting hypothesis based on absolutely nothing in which he said that the reason there are canals on Mars, the reason the Martian engineers are building canals in the first place, is because Mars is a dying planet. And Mars is a dying planet because it's further from the sun. And the further you are from the sun, the older the planet is. And the older the planet is, the more likely it is that it will have lost its water. And the water seeps into the center of the planet, and the surface dries out. And the poor Martian engineers have to feed their plants. They have to nourish their agriculture. And to do that, the only water that's left is at the polar caps. And they needed these canals to bring the water from the polar caps to the agricultural regions which were near the equator. That's Percival Lowell's thesis. He published an article in 1907 in Nature. Nature was already, 100 years ago, a very important magazine for science. And he wrote, it is a direct sequitur from this, that the planet is at present the abode of intelligent, constructive life. I may say in this connection that the theory of life upon Mars was in no way an a priori hypothesis on my part, but the deduced outcome of observation, and that my observations since have fully confirmed it. No other supposition is consonant with all the facts observed here. I'd question some of that. But the press didn't. So we have Martians build two immense canals in two years. Martians finish canal on planet. This is February 17, 1907. Big headlines in newspapers all around the country. Yes. I think I have some numbers for you in just a moment on that. They thought they knew about temperatures. They very much got it wrong. Okay. Percival Lowell thought the average temperature on Mars, I think, was 47 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be comfortable. Nicer than today. New York Times. Mars inhabited, says Professor Lowell, declares the planet to be the abode of intelligent, constructive life. August 30th, 1907, page one. And it cost a penny. I don't have the picture of the journal here, but from the Wall Street Journal in December 1907, this is their, news, their, their issue saying, here's what happened this year, the important things that happened this year. Certainly, it has not been the financial panic. I guess they had a financial panic in 1907. It has not been the financial panic which is occupying our minds to the exclusion of most other thoughts. No, the most extraordinary development has been the proof. It's an important word here. The proof afforded by astronomical observations of the year that conscious, intelligent human life exists upon the planet Mars. This proves the existence of intelligent life upon that globe. There could be no more wonderful achievement than this, to establish the fact of life upon another planet. I think the last sentence is a good one. Okay. This is the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Page one, the greatest thing that happened this year is we discovered intelligent human life on Mars. <laughs> 1908, Percival Lowell publishes one more book, Mars as the Abode of Life. 
He continues his barnstorming. In that book, he published his map of Mars. And again, we have this polar region here with lots of water and down here. And then we have these long canals going to these equatorial regions to feed the agricultural regions in the equatorial regions. OK. I don't know why it said that. All right. Temperatures. Had a question about temperatures. Percival Lowell in 1907 calculated that the temperature at the surface of Mars was 47 degrees pretty much all year long. The fact that Mars has seasons didn't really bother him. The real temperature of Mars, what we know today, Mars can get as cold as minus 243 Fahrenheit. Mars can get very briefly midsummer at noon at the equator plus 68 Fahrenheit. The average temperature on Mars, though, is minus 80. It's, it's not a warm, pleasant place. It's a harshly cold place. Lowell calculated in 1907 that the surface pressure on Mars was 1 12th of the surface pressure on Earth. That's OK. It's wrong. The actual surface pressure is 6 thousandths of the surface pressure on Earth. So he was wrong by a factor of a lot. Mars. Lowell said in 1907 that Mars's gravity is strong enough to hold on to all the gases except hydrogen. Well, I showed you strong, moderate evidence that says that ain't the case. Lowell said in 1907 that, the Earth, that, that Mars's atmosphere was like the Earth's. It was full of lots of oxygen and water vapor. It has no oxygen. It has virtually no water vapor. Mars's atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. It's a very different place. Lowell thought he had all the answers to everything. And all his he did have answers. They were just all wrong. Okay. The person who, yes, ma'am. Peer review is a more modern concept. We're talking 1907. Peer, no, peer review would be more you publish your paper, and then I think you're wrong, so I do some research and I challenge you and I publish my paper. That's not quite. Modern peer review. Well, who are the scientific experts at the New York Times in 1907 who can challenge the great Percival Lowell? You know, this was big news. The person who finally put an end to this silliness was this guy, Eugene Antoniadi. He started his career as an astronomer in Turkey. He got hired by the British Astronomical Association to become their Mars expert. When he first started doing this, 1896, 1898, he was solidly in Percival Lowell's camp. There are canals on Mars. He gradually began thinking otherwise. In what he called his sixth interim report for the British Astronomical Association in 1909, he wrote, it is high time that evidence of this kind should be pronounced worthless. And but for such uncertain data, usually obtained with inferior telescopes, there would never have been a question of canals on Mars. He said, again, <coughs> he continued, we have, of course, no more right to speak of the true canals on Mars than of the dikes of Mars or the roads of Mars. Whether such things exist not on, or not on the planet, we cannot know. And any consideration regarding them must be treated as unwarranted speculation. The term canal has no more relevancy on Mars than C on the moon. Four years later, he wrote in his next report, the canal fallacy, after retarding progress for a third of a century, is doomed to be relegated into myths of the past. And that's where it went, into the past. But slowly, one of the things that Percival Lowell succeeded in doing was making planetary astronomy a, black, a backwater. If you wanted to become an astronomer after Percival Lowell, you did not study planets. You studied stars and galaxies because Percival Lowell had, had, soil, had yeah, soiled the water, whatever the right words are there. He, he'd made a mess of it. Planetary astronomy would not come back until the space age with the launch of Sputnik. We're going to talk about some stuff that happened in planetary astronomy regarding Mars next week, over the you know, next half century. But very few people were involved in studying planets in this period, because Percival Lowell had made a mess of it. Uh, the other thing Percival Lowell made a mess of was Pluto. Uh, 
One of the things he wanted to discover with his low observatory was the so-called planet X. It is not an accident that Pluto was discovered at Lowell Observatory in 1930. It's not an accident that Pluto starts with PL, as in Percival Lowell. Okay. <laughs> Lowell made a series of mathematical calculations over decades, predicting exactly where this great planet in the outer solar system would be. And his calculations were all wrong. But based on those calculations, he had his team of astronomers at Lowell Observatory look for Pluto. He died in 1916. They found Pluto in 1930, exactly where he said to look, except his calculations were terrible, which tells you something important about Pluto. What it tells you is if you look in that part of the solar system hard enough in any direction, you're going to see something. But that's a whole other Osher series on Pluto. All right, so I've, I'm done for today, I think, uh, and I will see you next week.